Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Hi, it's Marin here. We have got something special coming up on October the 31st at 8 a.m. at Bloomberg headquarters. It is going to be Marin on the budget. Well, not just Marin on the budget. Marin plus John plus Stephanie and plus special guest Andy King, who knows an awful lot about fiscal policy and fiscal matters. So it's going to be educational, maybe interesting, and we'll have a run through what the budget, about which we now know almost nothing, will mean for you. So if you're interested in joining us or signing up for the event, do look in the show notes where there will be a link or look out for it in Money Distilled, John's brilliant newsletter, which I know you all get already. Right, onwards. Welcome to Merrin Talks Money, the podcast in which people who know the markets explain the markets. I'm Merrin Somerset Webb. This week, I'm joined by Lizanne Saunders, Managing Director and Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. We talk about the Federal Reserve's monetary policy, how investors can navigate these particularly difficult markets, and with the US election just around the corner, we talk about the impact of elections on markets. Welcome, Lizanne, to Merrin Talks Money. Lizanne, thank you so much for joining us again. It's really nice to have you back on. Oh, nice to be on again, Marin. Thank you so much. Well, look, there is so much going on at the moment. So an ordinary investor looking, looking around them, they can see uh, the American election coming up, inflation falling below most, most people's targets, suggesting you know more interest rate cuts to come. There's uh, geopolitical tension all over the place, lots going on in the energy markets, all sorts of things. How do we even begin to make sense of this? You know, this has been uh, an incredibly unique cycle, both in terms of the economy and the market. Maybe that's the ultimate understatement, but I I think it's worth uh, thinking about what has made this cycle unique. And and a lot of it ties back to COVID and the aftermath of COVID in the sense that you've had these bifurcations with, particularly within the economy. When When we had the early part of the pandemic and the stimulus kicked in, that was largely to the sole benefit of the good side of the economy, not just in the United States, but globally, because of course, services were completely shut down. So that was where the burst of activity initially happened. That's where the burst of inflation started. Uh-huh. But then fast forward, we had the later opening back up of services, the pent up demand associated with that. In turn, the services or non goods categories within inflation. Uh, surged later and are stickier uh, by nature, Um, even though we've actually had, one could argue, recessions in parts of the economy that were earlier beneficiaries, housing, housing housing-related, manufacturing, a lot of stay-at-home beneficiaries on the consumer products side of things. We've actually gone into deflation in the goods categories of inflation indicators. We've just had the offsetting strength in the economy on the services side, services a larger employer, helping to explain the the resilience of the labor market and stickier inflation data. And those bifurcations have actually morphed into what's happened in the market too, where you've had this large cap bias, but much more churn and weakness and turmoil even under the surface at the average stock level. So that's the connection point, I think, between what's been going on in the economy in this unique cycle and the market. Okay, so how does the economy look now to you? And there's a lot more discussion coming up about uh, no landing. You know, there's not going to be a soft landing. There's going to be a hard landing. Now we're in a world of no landing, which sounds great. Is that, is that what you see happening? Yeah, it sounds great. But but again, we, we have had landings. We've had hard landings in those interest-sensitive segments of the economy. Uh, And in the case of manufacturing, hasn't yet pulled out of its sectoral recession. It wasn't enough weakness to take the whole economy down with it, but we're still trying to claw out of hard landings in manufacturing, in housing, in housing related. Whether the rest of the economy, the more services-oriented can hang in there, so far so good. The economy looks in decent shape. Services is a much larger share of the economy. So the economy can continue to chug along without an officially declared recession. I think the real key, because consumption is such a big part of the U.S. economy, is for the labor market to remain healthy. I think that is the, that has been the feeder into resilient consumption, um, more so than traditional metrics like the savings rate, or even in this cycle, the excess savings uh, level. Uh, 
Um, but I think the labor market does have to hang in there. If the labor market were to really crack from here, and that's not our base case, but I think that would feed into weaker consumption patterns probably fairly quickly. So what, what's your base case on the labor market? So far, so good. The most recent uh, jobs report obviously was was very strong, and not only just on the surface with the headlines of payrolls and the unemployment rate, but the innards of the report were quite strong, not to mention you had positive revisions, upward revisions to the prior couple of months, and that bucked uh, the recent uh, trend. But that was one month. And we have another jobs report between now and the November Fed meeting. And so we'll get more color. Of course, the, the big rub here in the United States is that hurricanes and tornadoes and Mother Nature is likely to wreak havoc with a lot of this labor market data, certainly things like initial unemployment claims. So it's going to be hard, frankly, to get a true picture of the health of the labor market, given how severe some of these storms have been and the implications that that has for a lot of the real-time leading indicator type labor market data points. And those storms could then have an impact on the inflation data as well, right? Absolutely. I think it's a question of whether there's enough color commentary around any potential pickup in inflation suggestive of it being more storm-related and not some turn back higher for traditional supplier demand uh, reasons. I, I think if you if you had a scenario where, and, and we did get CPI last week, which wouldn't have been as as uh, sort of shaded by uh, some of the storm impacts, it was slightly hotter than expected. Uh, if we were to get another couple of readings that were stronger than expected, with an extrapolation being that, hey, this is more than just storm related, you add that to recent better labor market data. And it's part of the reason why you've you've not only taken a 50 basis point cut by the Fed off the table at this point, there is a, a, a you know reasonable likelihood um, of of the Fed not doing anything, um, just you know moving quickly into pause mode, which certainly was not expected uh, even a few weeks ago. Yeah. So your view on inflation as a whole, do you think it is pretty much dealt with, give or take, you know, an odd little tick up here or there, here or there, but that the big crisis is over? Well, it depends on how you define dealt with. I, I think uh, you know the a. Uh, 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 hanging of the of a banner saying, you know, victory, our job is done, nothing to see here, let's move forward. I think that that's a little uh, naive. I, I happen to think that from an inflation, secular inflation backdrop perspective, not, you know, what the next monthly reading on CPI or PCE is going to be, I think we're we're likely transitioning or already in a secular inflation backdrop that doesn't look like the 25 years or so leading into the pandemic, um, often uh, referred to as the great moderation era from the mid to late 90s up until the early part of the pandemic, really up until the COVID-related spike in inflation. And that was a period of uh, very benign inflation, very little inflation volatility, very benign interest rate backdrop. It was driven by a lot of powerful secular forces, including globalization and China joining the uh, WTO and basically flooding the world with cheap and abundant access to goods and to labor. We had actually less geopolitical instability than we are, have right now. There's demographics that have come into play. So I think the the era we're in now, if you were to liken it to an era of the past, may look a little more uh, like the what I've been calling the temperamental era, which was the 30 years prior to the Great Moderation. So the span from the, the mid-60s to about the mid-1990s. And that was a an era of more inflation volatility. That's not the same thing as saying high inflation the whole time. And that's not my perspective in this environment, but more inflation volatility, bigger swings on the upside and downside. And that was in conjunction with greater economic volatility. So shorter cycles, more frequent recessions, but stronger growth phases on the upside. And I think we may be back in that environment. And I think the the Fed, to some degree, may be in that camp too. And they want to be mindful of not repeating the mistakes made in the 60s and 70s in particular of premature uh, you know, declaration of victory, easing policy only to see inflation reignite again. And then you know, Arthur Burns having to scramble and tighten policy again. And we went through that process twice. 
uh, until Paul Volcker had to come in, did the same thing until finally interest rates had to be jacked up to the moon in order to finally combat this these fits and starts of inflation. So I think we're in a more inflation volatility, um, even if inflation in the near term is not set to, to move up markedly. Okay. And it feels like a lot of that inflation volatility will be driven by global forces as opposed to domestic Correct. forces. So driven by constantly shifting supply chains, driven by people feeling like they need to, to reshore their manufacturing or French shore it and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we're not, we're not in the deglobalization camp, but there's definitely a change in the nature of globalization, to your point, regionalization, supply chain diversification. But there's also the demographics associated with labor supply. Um, that's a global... A phenomenon. And I, I think one of the implications of this uh, is that labor relative to its own history is picking up as a sort of a share of the economy and therefore wields maybe a bit more power. Uh, that all else equal uh, is supportive of more inflation volatility. Does that feel in lots of ways though rather like a, a good thing in that um, over the last uh, period during the great moderation, particularly during the, the great Great QE period, it's rather felt like labor has been on, on the back foot and in many places real wages have actually been falling. And so this seems to me, uh, to lots of people, like a, like a really good thing that labor regains in power, that real wages rise. Yeah, and, the, and then the consumption rises as a result and we have a, maybe a, a more balanced economy. Right. These things go in long secular waves and they're global in nature, not just in, in the US. If you look at you know profits as a share of GDP over the long term and you look at labor via compensation as a share of GDP. You you go in waves and and clearly in the recent past, profits has been at the high end of its historical range in terms of as a share of GDP and labor the opposite. But they're they're starting to converge, not toward each other in terms of weight within the economy, but relative to their own history history. You're seeing labor garner a little bit higher a share of GDP and profits a little bit uh, lower a share. And globally, I think that that, uh, that probably has, has legs in part just because of labor supply uh, problems that are uh, largely global in nature. Yeah. Now, a great hope, of course, is that the shortage of labor supply encourages companies to behave in such a way that enhances productivity across the board, that it encourages a new wave of CapEx and alongside that all the benefits from AI, which of course we don't really understand yet. It's impossible for us to forecast what AI will actually do. Right? We don't really know. But our hope is that all these things will combine to give us a huge boost in productivity, which will support continued real wage growth. And, and productivity has been has been healthy. It's 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 premature at this point to try to pinpoint AI's contribution to that stronger productivity, but that's been certainly one of the brighter spots within the US economy is decent productivity. Now in the very near term, meaning you know the next few weeks, we we've had sort of a stall in capex and in, in plans for capex for somewhat obvious reasons around uncertainty with regard to the election. So I think to to really see a renewed cycle of capital spending or get a sense of whether there will be a renewed cycle of capital spending, we've got to get through this period of uncertainty between now and the election. Yeah, I don't want any of our UK readers to, to mistakenly believe that productivity has had a big pickup in the UK as well, because I'm afraid it hasn't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, that's okay. That's okay. But you know, we wait and we wait and we wait, but it just doesn't happen. And we talk about digitalization and, and the great productivity boom coming from technology and AI, etc. And we just we just sit and, and we wait. But let's talk a little bit about the um, the reason for the slowdown in capex in in the US, which is of course the election coming up. And I'm certainly not going to ask you to pick a side or anything appalling like that. Who would want to have to do that? Um, but what tends to happen uh, in in an election, I and mean, everyone knows that, that the run up to an election is usually very good for stock markets. But what happens after that? And and is it is there a big difference between parties? Uh, what should we be looking looking out for? You have to be careful about generalizing and and looking at long term averages and and suggesting that that's some sort of typical performance because there is such a wide range around outcomes. Whether you look at the four year election cycle and which year tends to be best, which year tends to be worst. Actually, the best year on average um, has been the pre-election year. And, and last year was a strong year for the market here in the United States. So obviously that was in in keeping. But you tend to see a little bit more weakness and volatility in the election year. And we've kind of bucked that trend with a, a strong 
market this year. You often get a lot of sector-related volatility and trading moves in the lead into election, but that tends to be more pronounced if you have uh, less of a tight um, relationship between the parties within Congress. And I think regardless of what happens uh, during the election with Congress, we're not going to have wide majorities, which means that there's a limit to how much of these policy proposals that are natural on the campaign trail can actually become policies because of what is likely to be a pretty uh, narrow margin, uh, regardless of what happens with the makeup of uh, of Congress. It's also, frankly, a, a bit of a fool's errand to, to try to trade around election outcomes, especially if those trading moves are based on an assumption that the policies actually become policy proposals, become policies. I, I think that there's a lot of naivete when it comes to that. I, I see headlines all the time of, you know, if Harris wins, then taxes are going through the roof. Or if Trump wins, are all the tax cuts are going to uh, remain in place. And that's just not, it's not the way the government works. And uh, the other thing that happens is, is I think th there's assumptions that are made that translates into, well, if so-and-so wins, it's good for fill in the blank. And, and here's an anecdote that I think a lot of people don't realize, and it, it highlights the, the care you need to take with applying politics too much to your perspective on market moves. So Trump clearly is considered pro-traditional energy, and, and Biden-Harris are considered more pro you know, uh, renewables and, and uh, green energy. Well, the S&P energy sector, uh, which is one of 11 sectors, is, is all traditional energy. In fact, almost half the, in, the, 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 that index, that energy index, is two companies. It's uh, ExxonMobil and Chevron. But the rest of the companies in the energy sector are traditional exploration production companies, traditional drilling companies. There's not a green energy company, a solar company, a wind company in there. So you would think that under the Trump administration, energy would have fared well. Well, from inauguration day to inauguration day, energy was not only the worst performing sector, it was the only one down, and it was down by 40%. The next worst sector was up by 20%. Um, fast forward to the Biden-Harris administration, from inauguration day to Friday's close, energy has been by far the best performing sector, even more so than technology. Now that is not because Trump was secretly anti-traditional energy and Harris Biden were secretly pro-traditional energy. The point is that there are so many forces that impact what the market does, what sectors do, what individual stocks do, and tying it to political party is just a fool's uh, errand. Right now, U.S. households are very exposed to equity, I mean, as much as they've been since since the two early 2000s. Is that a good allocation of their capital, do you think, in the run-up to the election and with the valuations of the U.S. market as they are, et cetera? It seems ambitious. There's no way to generalize an answer uh, to that. And and I actually, Marin, I, I, I find that when I get often questions that are even more specific than that, you know, what... What should investors be doing? How much exposure should they have to, you know, equities or fixed income? As if there's one cookie cutter answer, that's right. I could actually have a bird land on my shoulder from the future and say, all right, wink, wink here, Lizanne, I've got, I'm going to give you 98% odds that the stock market's going to do X, um, that the bond market's going to do X. And I were then sitting across from two investors one investor is 22 years old. They just inherited $10 million from the grandparents. They don't need the money. They're not going to obsess over the portfolio balance. They're not going to freak out and panic if there's a you know, 15 or 20% drop in their portfolio. And then the other investor sitting across from me is 78 years old, has built a nest egg. Uh, that's their retirement nest egg. Um, they can't afford to lose any of the principal, and they're living on the income generated. So I have basically rounded to 100% conviction of what the markets are going to do. What I would tell those two investors is entirely different. So shame on anyone that answers with specificity. Even just in the confines of my world at Charles Schwab, we have $10 trillion of client assets. That's a wide array of risk tolerances and time horizons and need for income and tax bracket. So uh, yes, uh, you know, if you if you just on the surface add 
near record equity exposure on the part of individuals to other sentiment indicators. Maybe it falls on the, the, as a contrarian indicator on the concerning side of the ledger, but, but that, that kind of environment of lofty sentiment, either attitudinal measures of sentiment, too much optimism or behavioral measures like exposure to equities that can stay that way for years. You know, people forget that. And it has stayed that way for years. Yeah. Alan Greenspan's famous irrational exuberance comment was made in 1996 and the stock market didn't peak for another three and a half years. So one thing I always say about investor sentiment, whether it's the attitudinal measures or the behavioral measures like exposure, like fund flows, is it's a terrible market timing tool. I mean, there's no good market timing tool, but think sentiment is, is it gives you a backdrop, but it doesn't give you a signal. Well, that's an interesting point. There is no good market timing tool, is there? there and we can look at valuations not. absolutely nonstop. We can look at all sorts of things, but in the end, it's all about momentum. Markets go up until they stop going up, and then they go down until they stop going down, and you can't time either. That's right. What you can do, of course, is, is you know buy cheap things and hold them for a very long time, but no one can tell you when even those cheap things are going to turn, as we keep finding in the UK market. Well, uh, but I would add into it the disciplines around, and it's this, and this is the funny part, because this is the stuff that actually matters. But I suppose it's the stuff that's more boring to talk about. Uh, more interesting, if you're certainly if you're, you know, listening to a podcast or watching financial television, it's more interesting to have somebody come on and make some bombastic forecast and try to time the market when the reality is, it's not what I know, or you know, or the investor knows about what's going to happen in the future, because we don't know. It's not what we know that matters. It's what we do along the way. And that's where disciplines like diversification across and within asset classes, and probably the most beautiful discipline of all, which is rebalancing, periodic rebalancing, because it forces us to do a version of what we know we're supposed to. Not so much buy low, sell high, because that almost infers all in, all out. It's add low and trim high. And when left to our own devices, we, we often do uh, the opposite. Yeah, no, it's interesting. We we used to run, John and I, not run, but to have a, in our head a, a group of investment trusts that uh, that we five investment trusts uh, listed in the UK, a diverse group. And uh, of these investment trusts, one of them did unbelievably well. Scottish mortgage soared to the sky and then, of course, uh, collapsed right. later, not completely collapsed, but didn't do so well. And we told our, our readers for years, every six months, to rebalance, 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 rebalance. And those who had would have made a fortune. Absolutely. And those who did not, of course, were incredibly disappointed. I have a, f a fun anecdote about the just the, the odd psychology that comes into the idea of, of rebalancing. I was at a client event a few months ago, and a client came up to me uh, after the event and said, I'm, I'm really... I'm really annoyed. I'm really frustrated. Uh, it was suggested that I trim a little bit of my NVIDIA position. So I did. I, I trimmed about 5% of the position and the stock kept going up and I'm really annoyed. So I paused and I said, would you be happier with the 95% that you still own if the stock cratered? Because then you could pat yourself on the back for having trimmed a little bit at some perfect peak. And to his credit, he paused. He said, I can't believe I didn't think of it that way. But that's the right way to think about it. <laughs> but it is, I mean, it is a, it's a difficult discipline. It's a difficult discipline. It, it, you know, it, it and is. you have out there a lot of people saying, run your winners, run your winners, go with the momentum. No, it's hard for an ordinary investor who's making money to, to think to themselves, I'm going to have to sell some of that, even though I think it's going to keep going up. I mean, I absolutely agree with you. It's yeah, just hard. It, it is hard. But um, the the downside is if you continue to let the winners just run, run, knowing that there will be an inevitable pullback phase, whatever the stock or the group or the index or the sector. And with the absent rebalancing, it just becomes a much larger share of your portfolio. And in turn, the the parts of the portfolio that might have been underperforming in relative terms will at some point have their day in the sun. And it just, rebalancing just keeps investors in gear. It smooths the ride such that at the end of whatever the period is, there's just been less volatility, less emotional turmoil. 
even if you don't have the bragging rights of, I just nailed the top and the bottom in this stock or this sector or this index, and which nobody can do consistently anyway. So I just think that they're sort of the unsung heroes of what matters for investors. Okay, so asset allocation, diversification, rebalancing is the best you can do. That's th Those are the things that uh, that matter, frankly. Okay, well, let's look at the first two, asset allocation, diversification. Let's, uh, I know you. it's hard, it's hard as you say, because there's so many different situations, but a young person today, a young person today, they haven't inherited 10 million, <laughs> not quite so good, but maybe they've got a little lump sum. And that's looking at this cash and they're thinking, God, what on earth do I do with it? How, how would you allocate assets across the board at the moment? And, and how would you diversify? I would probably ask a couple of questions first before I might uh, advise. And, and keep in mind, I don't advise clients directly, um, individually. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not sitting uh, down with them and telling them how much exposure to have to different asset classes. We're not looking for financial advice. We're looking for a sort of rough sense of what makes sense to you right now. I would probably ask a question back, which is, do you have a, a sense of whether your emotional risk tolerance is tied directly to your financial risk tolerance. Because I think a lot of investors learn the hard way that during a tumultuous period, a bear market or a crash or, or really heightened volatility, that what they thought was a high risk tolerance based on things like time horizon um, turned out not to be if it resulted in, in a panic and I, I can't, I don't want to lose any more money, not because they need the money. So that, that would be the first question back. But assuming some connectivity between the emotional and financial side of things, um, then I, I think it, it's proper to have a little more bias on the equity uh, side of things to make sure there's also some international diversification and not just domestic equities. Then there's more of the near-term issues around whether um, you know an equal weighted approach makes more sense than a cap weighted approach uh, until very recently the cap weighted approach was the the right way to go but it also established a lot of concentration risk yeah for yeah. investors and that's something that that's unique to this part of this cycle so it's not that's less of the broad answer and more of the specific answer there's also for individuals especially that have a long time horizon, there's been so much democratization of this business and asset classes and the ability to take diversification beyond just the standard stocks, bonds, cash, and the ability even at low uh, um, you know, allocation amounts to potentially have exposure within the private markets or commodities or precious metals. So I, I think that there has been an opening with this democratization to exposure to other asset classes to maybe make that diversification a bit more robust. You have to be mindful of tying up the money, which can often be the case in the private markets. But for a younger person that has a very long time horizon, um, that's something that could be considered uh, as well. Somebody that is, has a much shorter time horizon can't afford maybe to, to, to sort of lock some portion of their portfolio in asset classes that don't have that immediate liquidity. So that would be another consideration. It's something we talk about a lot, this massive growth in the private market so, and whether there will soon be a pendulum swing back towards the public markets again, or if maybe you know, gradually, gradually everything will end up private exaggeration, but you know what I mean. It's definitely a shift. You think that's right? Yeah, but I, I think it's more of an and, not an or. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. Particularly, individual investors shouldn't be put in a position to think that they have to try to time public markets versus private markets. I think that there, frankly, to some degree, will always be opportunities in both. And and precious metals does it make sense for everyone to have some allocation to, for example, gold? Well, it depends on what your goal uh, would be, and I'm not. I'm not an analyst on on precious metals, um, but I think. You know, a lot of the the money that it's found its way into to gold in in the recent period of time has actually not been uh, around as an inflation hedge, and and that has historically been a consideration for people. They think of gold as an inflation hedge. It actually has not been a pretty co a consistent inflation hedge really since you know Bretton Woods. But and, is it now maybe catching up and the, the, the rises that we're seeing in the gold price recently may be beginning to compensate holders for the inflation of the last couple of years? But I think the reason why gold's been going up is more around geopolitical uncertainty, less around inflation. 
So I think the why behind gold's move up, I think, is important as a consideration. Yes, it's therefore been to the benefit of inflation having eroded um, other asset class performance. But I think the re the reasoning behind moves into gold has been less about inflation and more about uh, geopolitics. Mm. Okay. What about the sectors that one traditionally, or the areas that one traditionally looks at during a an easing cycle, so small caps, infrastructure, this kind of thing, the sectors that people normally look at when they think interest rates are... are... Uh, you know, you're right that small caps tend to do quite well when you're in an easing cycle. The rub this time is that the the easing is is happening not because the Fed is combating a recession, but because they want to kind of get a jump on bringing policy back in line uh, alongside inflation that has uh, eased. But we clearly haven't had full-blown recession-type conditions. It's the combination of easier monetary policy and the inflection point coming out of a recession that has historically accrued to the benefit of small caps where profits really got crushed and you've got that leverage to a turn back up in the economy that happens obviously when you're coming out of recession. So we've got the easier monetary po policy part of it, but we don't have that turn up anticipated in the economy that provides that huge profitability boost, especially in the down the quality spectrum for small caps. And it's still the case that 40% of the Russell 2000 index of small caps are some combination of not profitable or zombie companies, the, the companies that don't have sufficient cash flow even to pay the interest on their debt. So those interest payments on debt have come down, but you're unlikely to get that profitability boost, which is why in this cycle we're saying there are opportunities down the cap spectrum. You probably want to be mindful of looking for opportunities outside just the Magnificent Seven and the mega cap names. But in doing so, you want to stay up in quality because of the absence of those recession type conditions that allow for that launch point that accrues to the benefit of the lower quality companies within small caps. I just don't think that that represents this cycle or where we are in this cycle. Okay, fair enough. Now, last thing, this diversification across the board, would that for you involve crypto? No. No. Would it not even involve Bitcoin? Okay, but so I'm a skeptic. I... I'm an avowed skeptic. <laughs> I, what is your I, what's your skepticism based on? I have yet to get a, a compelling answer to a question I ask everybody that's either an expert or a believer, which is what problem is this solving for? I get lots of different answers, but none that are terribly compelling. It's not a currency. Um, it, it's not it's not a store of value. It's not a medium of exchange. Uh, it's a it's a speculative investment that's made a lot of people a lot of money. So. Have at it, um, but just be mindful of, of of what it represents. It's not the next Bitcoin is not taking over the from the dollar as the world's reserve currency. It's not a currency. So um, I think, frankly, a lot of the same type of money, meaning the rationale behind it, um, that has that might have otherwise gone into crypto, is some of the same conceptual money that's gone into gold. Yeah. Okay. So if I gave you a choice of gold or Bitcoin. I'm kind of guessing you choose gold. Yes. <laughs> Good thought. Is there, any, is there anything that would make you change your mind? Uh, not, not that I can think of in the near term. I, that I'm not a, I'm not a, a, you know, a gold believer forever. I'm not a gold bug by any means. I just when I when I look at at the type of flows that we've seen, I, I think there's a little bit of a mirror, and I think probably it's a little bit more of the air quotes, you know, smart money that, that veers into precious metals for maybe some of the same perceived reasons as, as the money that's gone into crypto. But I think crypto is more of a kind of a money chasing. I, 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 I want to make a lot of money. I want to speculate and, and, you know, everybody has the right to, to do that. But I think there's less there, there in terms of, of it representing, um, something compelling. And, and, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's been around since 2009, when people say, well, it's still in its infancy, and therefore, you know, give it time to become a true medium of exchange. And in the world of innovation and technology, I don't know, 15 years is a long time. It is quite a long time, isn't it? You would have thought someone could have come up with a good answer to what's it for by now. Right. <laughs> um, Lizanne, thank you so much for joining My us pleasure. today. My pleasure.
Thanks for listening to this week's Marin Talks Money. If you like our show, rate, review and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And keep sending questions or comments to marinmoney at bloomberg.net. You can also follow me and John on Twitter or X. I'm at MarinSW and John is John underscore Stepek. This episode was hosted by me, Marin Zamset Webb. It was produced by Sam Asadi and Isabella Ward. Production support and sound design by Moses Andam. And special thanks, of course, to Liz and Saunders. <laughs>